Melton, Palermo, Rowe, Bagley, Harding, Johnson, Mr. President. Please rise for the pledge and remarks by Councilmember Don Rowe. Go ahead and have a seat, if you will. And I will choose. I want to use the mic. I wanted to share last week was a tough week for five of my grandkids down in Lincoln. They had to say goodbye to their other grandpa, Don, for the last time. And uh, as Marcy and I were sitting at the memorial service on Saturday, there was a, you know, the video up on the big screen in front of the church and is kind of going through slides of his life and I couldn't help but be reminded of a, a poem that a friend sent me probably 20 years ago that I keep in my desk even to this day and it's it's a treasure uh, that is probably uh, known to all of you in the room I'm sure you've heard it and if you have it'll just be a good reminder to hear it. If you haven't, um, you're in for a treat. The author is uh, named Linda Ellis, and it's called The Dash. I read of a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on the tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that first came the date of birth and spoke of the following date with tears. But he said what mattered most of all was the dash between those years. For that dash represents all the time that they spent alive on earth, and now only those who love them know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we live and love and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard are there things that you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left that can still be rearranged. If we could just slow down enough to consider what's true and real and always try to understand the way other people feel and be less quick to anger and show appreciation more and love the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering this special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read with your life sections to rehash, would you be proud of the things they say about how you spent your dash? Thanks, Mr. President, for the extra time. Thank you. And our thoughts are with you and your family. Madam Clerk. An affidavit of publication is on file for the pre-council and city council meeting, and a current copy of the Open Meeting Act is posted in a white banner on the east wall of legislative chambers. Good afternoon and welcome to the Omaha City Council. We look forward to hearing your testimony on our various items today. Please turn your cell phones to off or to vibrate. Item six, a resolution to approve the preliminary plat for Avenue One, Replat Two, located southeast of 188th and Burke Streets. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing and vote on number six is today. Proponents, please. Kyle Hazy, ENA Consulting Group, 10909 Mill Valley Road, representing the applicant. Um, we are looking at replatting a portion of the avenue mixed use uh, plan. Uh, the reason for the replatting and uh, is to add uh, what was previously as townhome lots. We'll now be adding a church lot and then two separate lots for uh, townhomes. Um, the road that goes to the north side of these proposed lots previously went down the middle of the lots, and so um, there's the replat of that road as well. Uh, with that, I'll make myself available for any questions or comments you may have. Thank you. Any other proponents today? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Yes. Roll call. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Rowe. Yes. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. 
Item six is approved okay. seven to zero. Item seven, a resolution to approve the preliminary plat for West Farm Replant Nine, located southwest of 145th and Davenport Streets. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing and vote on number seven is today. Proponents, please. Yes, uh, Joe Flaxbeard with Lampert Nearson, 14710 West Dodge Road on behalf of the applicant. Uh, this minor plat has really just taken one of the larger lots that was originally platted and subdividing it into four smaller lots. Uh, we've been working with planning and public works consistent with the master plan and uh, I'm here with the, uh, for any questions. Thank you. Other proponents on number seven? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed? Second. Roll call. Melton? Yes. Palermo? Yes. Rowe? Yep. Bagley? Aye. Harding? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Item seven is approved seven to zero. Item eight, a resolution to approve the preliminary plat for Flynn Subdivision One, located northeast of 66 and Grover Streets. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing and vote on number eight is today. Proponents, please. Good afternoon. Uh, Mike McIntosh with Lampre Nearson, 14710 West Dodge Road. Uh, thank you for hearing our case today. I'm here representing Omni Engineering. Uh, Omni Engineering is proposing to replace an existing asphalt plant that is in operation today. Uh, this is near 66 and Grover. Uh, with a new state-of-the-art asphalt plant that will be operated in a similar fashion. Uh, also here today is Kyle Timmer with Omni Engineering uh, who can help answer any specific plant operation questions if there's any that come up. So happy to answer any questions regarding the plat. Thank you. Other proponents today? Kyle Timmer with Omni Engineering, 14012 Giles Road. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Any other proponents on number eight? Seeing none, we'll move to opponents in the room. Are there any, any opponents here today? If not, I know we have an opponent by Zoom. We'll now move to Mr. Kasakavicius. I think you're off mute. If you're there, your name and address, please. All right, try it now. I don't, are you available by uh, Zoom? You should be off mute if you want to try your own on your own end there. All right, I think he's trying. So what we'll do is likely come back to him. In the meantime, I'll ask for any more opponents that might be in the room. If, sorry. Okay, we have we do we do have your comments in your letter that was submitted by email. Um, would you like to speak today or not? We'll, co we'll come back to you in case you do, in case you're having technology problems there. In the meantime, I'm going to recognize Councilmember Bagley. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, either uh, Mike or Kyle, a couple questions for you. How many trucks a day will go in and out of that plant? Um, Kyle Timmer, Omni Engineering, 14012 Giles Road. Uh, we're looking at probably 300 trucks a day as you look at it. And you own the road on the east side. I, I took a drive around there, so along the Papio Creek, that's your entrance road off of Grover. Yes. So tell me, when the 300 trucks a day go in there, are they going in and out that same exit or tell me how they're entering and exiting? So on the east side would be our, um, okay. The east side would be our ingress. We also own a section of the west side going out. That would be our egress, our exiting strategy. So it'd be bringing in on the east side along Papio Creek and exiting on the west side. In the past, how long have you guys had that plant there? There's been a plant there since 1969. Okay. And in the past, have they always gone in and out that east side? Um, there has been some utilization of the west side in the most recent years that has not been used. Okay. 
and you said that you guys own that road is that 66th street on the west side there um that is not a specific street it's owned property by uh, uh us and another in company so it's you split it or is that is that right you right both yeah we own, own 15 feet of it and they own it as part of their parcel okay and and your trucks when they go on the east side you don't have any intention of them coming out that east side to no. go back to grover right for for ease of traffic flow as you go around with all the congestion on the site because it is a relatively small site it makes the most sense i guess from our standpoint to have them come out and exit on the west side did you have conversation with anybody beyond the neighborhood there like at UNO or Baxter about the air quality from the plant um, we had a public meeting at the site that was put out to all the neighboring as required um, and then the other board meetings we had that we did not reach specifically out to uh, UNO or the Baxter arena area um, with regards to that um, but we answered any of the other questions that came up during planning okay and in the reading the minutes there was a comment if you can touch on this um, the smell in the truck traffic flow and exit strategy has been addressed can, can you touch on a little bit the the odor from this plant how that's been addressed or how that will be be handled with this new plant yep. so with the state-of-the-art plant there's different ways that we can capture the um, oil and most of the odor comes from in, when we unload the asphalt oil out of the tankers and put it into our tank farm it's not necessarily through the mixing process and with that there's charcoal filters and other um, innovations that are taking care and minimizing what that is so when there's a, that beautiful baseball stadium for UNO there now is air quality going to be a concern with this plant with that new baseball park there because obviously that wasn't there when this plant was built in 1969 right understand um air quality there is an air quality issues um when it comes to asphalt plants it was originally on um when the clean and quality air quality act came into play it was identified asphalt as a potential but since then under the epa's own accord it took away that um, designation um, we fall within all the permit requirements um, governed by the city we still have air quality permits that we have to um, attain for the new plant as we move forward um, and we'll have to meet all of those specific requirements can, can you differentiate for me the charcoal filtration as opposed to bag house filtration what the difference is okay but the bag house takes care of the process as, as the material goes through the plant and it sucks out any of the dust and particulates and we put it back into the mix basically the charcoal filtration is outside of that at our tank farm that would be used there can you speak to the papio creek that's on the east side of your plant there mm -hmm. any issues with water getting contaminated with this plant that's being built i, I know there's one there now but with yep. the new one that you're you want to build yep. with this there shouldn't be any issues whatsoever um you know all of our uh, asphalt itself is uh it's a hot material but it's not a hazardous material when you look at it it'll be inside containment etc from that standpoint um you know there'll be minor amounts of diesel fuel to um charge our loader and be able to operate from that standpoint but otherwise there shouldn't be any issues in respect to the noise pollution you touch on the air pollution with the number of trucks you said and i, I believe the number was it was 100 and now it's going to be 300 for concerned neighbors and businesses in the area for the increase of noise pollution um as you look at it you'll still you'll have the activity there we ha have a number of trucks that go in and out of there now um, the bigger pieces where noise comes from is going to be your backup alarms from uh, the safety aspect um, we do different things with those to put in uh, and eliminate the beep 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 backup alarms and make it more of a um, 
I'm trying to think of a squawking noise, but it still meets all the criteria to help reduce some of that. Um, but otherwise, the existing plant um, itself, the new plant will be a lot quieter than the existing plant because it has an internal burner instead of an external burner for combustion. Okay. Last question I got for you, and I appreciate your answering all these, because I got a lot of feedback from constituents, and I know you guys are aware of that with the meetings you've had. Um, that road on the east side, is there any reason why, and I can't tell you how to do your business, obviously, but, but why, because I get business owners in that area asking, well, if they use this one along the creek, and it's, I think they said it's 60 feet or whatever, I don't, I didn't measure it, but is there any reason why maybe you can't use that in respect to the business owners that are kind of on the west side of your plant? Right. So as you look at the east side, some of the area that's there now in being used within the new permitting requirements, we can't use part of that area. We have to narrow that up. So it's going to make it tighter as you bring trucks in and out along that same side. Um, that's because of, uh, you know, our actual property line right now runs along here. Our road is offset inside of that as we have to meet all the specifications there. So that's part of the reason why we can't use it. Um, the other piece of it is for the size of the site, it would require us to bring um, a road back around. This is an internal operational issue, um, like you mentioned, but that would cut down on our ability to use the entire site for the stockpiles that we need to be able to do our business. Okay, and you said, so there's gonna be 300 trucks going in there every day? Is that a Monday like, through Friday or Monday through Saturday, or what's the operation? Uh, Operation-wise, it'll depend on the jobs and the letting. So there's sometimes it's night work. I mean, the city requires us to do night work if we get a night contract or a contract with the city. Um, but otherwise, most of the time, it's um, five days to six days a week during our summer months. Okay, and uh, this is the last time I'm going to say this is the last question I'm going to ask you, but okay. can you tell me where your other locations are of your plants besides the 66 and Grover? Um, we have one off of uh, G Street and uh, Highway 75, uh, 2991, I believe it is, G Street, and then 14012 Giles Road. Okay, promise, last question. <laughs> with In respect to the, the state of Nebraska, I know that's Councilman Palermo's district, with closing off F Street, is that going to impact that location down there on yes. F Street? The F Street exit, entrance and exit is our main access to that plant at G Street right now. Um, with the planned expansion of um, the Kennedy Freeway and uh, 75 going southbound from there, they're planning on eliminating those entrance and exit ramps. So that would definitely affect our operations there. Okay, thanks, I appreciate your time. Can I, a couple of questions for Public Works? with Public Works. The traffic count that you guys did, when was that done for Grover Street going? Is, you know, we got a new project on 70th and northeast part of 70th and Grover, so can you talk about the traffic study that was done on Grover to account for the increase? It sounds like 300 trucks a day here. So the project you're referring to was called Maverick Landing. Um, when that was proposed to us, we analyze the potential impact that it had and we required that development to do a traffic impact analysis um, at that time no improvements were identified resulting from that project so 72nd and grover was sufficient to serve that redevelopment project in light of this proposed project we took a look at the potential increase in volumes and determined that a traffic study was not necessary uh, it falls below the threshold of, of what the city typically requires for a traffic impact study. Okay, so is it fair to say then it's it's 300 trucks a day instead of 100 with this asphalt plant? If this goes forward, it'll be 300 a day, correct? That's what the, according to the applicant, that's the overall okay. volume, yeah. And, and my question is, the uh, is that including, uh, just clarify for me, is the Maverick Landing taken into account with that 300 or is we're going to be 300 at the asphalt, the Omni plant, 
and then it'll be more trucks that are going to be going to Maverick Landing. So the Maverick Landing study happened first, and then subsequent to that, we received this application. Okay. That's all I got. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Milton. You're recognized. <clears throat> Come back. Ryan Hunts with Public Works. <laughs> Thanks. And I, right now, this plan has been operating since 1969. If we voted no, the plant could still continue to operate, correct? Would that be planning? That's, that's my understanding. That'd probably be a planning question. Eric England Planning Department. And so could this plant continue to operate as it is, it is today? Yes, it can. And they could still add another 200 trucks because that they they could in fact yes the, the only the plat and the rezoning is brought before this uh, board um, that would be in the event that they wipe the site clean and then in order to rebuild they would have to have a fully platted lot right now it's in lands description so it's not it doesn't have a legal description of you know lot one you know Flint's up well Flint subdivision one right. um, by them Cleaning the slight or cleaning the site and wiping it clean, that brings the plat forward. There's a small area that's zoned DR. That's the requirement for the, the rezoning. But if they kept operating, they wouldn't they can continue to do so. Well that's and that's kind of what I wanted. We we could keep it exactly the same as it is today, which sounds like there may be noise issues, potential odor issues, at least with the complaints we got, but they could continue to operate as is and have 300 trucks go through there per day by passing this and allowing them to clean the whole lot up. And then I think upgrade, it's gonna be a state of the art. So we're gonna upgrade everything to where in all honesty, it'll be a lot better than if we denied this and allowed it to keep on going the way it is today. Yeah, that is correct. This, you know, this action would allow them to modernize all of their equipment if they so choose or if this was denied they could get building permits to kind of piecemeal and add on to it and, and still add the trucks yes okay so by voting on this we're actually going to make it a better site tomorrow than it is today i would say modernized and, and improved equipment so yes i would say improved okay thank you yep. thank you we're going to go back and see if we can't get to the uh, opponent by zoom if we can click back to that screen mr Kazakovich, we're going to try it one more time and take you off mute here to see if we can add your testimony. Hi, there, yeah. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we got you now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, first off, so this is Paul Kazakovich. I do own uh, the lot to the west of the proposed plant site. Um, first, thanks to the council for allowing me to speak today. Um, and, and, your ad and your address, too? Uh, I'm sorry? Your, your address as well, for the record? Oh. Uh, 15070 Boyd Street, Omaha. Thank you. you bet. <clears throat> so um, a lot of my questions were, were answered from the questioning. Um, just a couple more questions there. So one is to the public works. When the application was submitted for additional traffic studies, was that done with 100 vehicles or 300 vehicles? Okay. We'll ask him that question here in a second. What was your okay. second? And then... Yeah, and, and so then um, normal hours of operation, I, I'm not sure I caught that. Okay, the plant. we can have them repeat that too. Anything else you'd like to add at the moment? Um, you know, really it was just around the noise as well, and I think most of that was, was answered. I don't know what, I don't know if they could speak to this different backup uh, alerting on these trucks as opposed to some change that that they're going to make it's, it seems to be milder or softer i don't know if they want to represent that in decibels or some other means that that you know is is layman's terms where we can put it into practice okay i'll i'll get them up here how's that that'd be great thank you all right sorry i will by, by matter of process now close the public hearing but if public works and or the applicant want to get up and address those three questions for us that the traffic study and the normal hours of operation and then if there's any um, calculation on 
expected noise decibels and such given the new truck backing up mechanisms that'd be appreciated. Ryan Haas with the Public Works Department. Um, don't know specifically what was the intent of the question. I'll, I'll just put out for reference the the city's requirements for traffic studies are a proposed new project which includes a net increase in trips of at least 100 new vehicular trips in the peak hour, the worst case scenario during the day. Um, and even then, sometimes they're required, sometimes they're not. So in this case, we're talking about 200 net trip increase over the entire course of the day. Um, that falls well below the, the threshold for what we typically require for a traffic study for analysis. Okay. Because it's, you know, it's spread out throughout the, the course of the day. Okay. Thank you. And then maybe the applicant can address the, the noise in the operating hours. Just, just repeat what you said earlier. Kyle Timmer, Omni Engineering, 14012 Giles Road. Um, our operation, again, are going to be dependent on um, the jobs that we have. Um, our normal customer base that comes in and picks up asphalt picks up from in the 7 o'clock range through probably about 4 in the afternoon. We would be started up with the asphalt plant before that, so we have mix in the silos waiting for them. So it could be 4 o'clock in the morning through that time frame, and then there would be some nighttime hours based on what contracts that we have if it requires that. Um, and then uh, it, what was the other question? What, so what might be... What? What might be considered normal hours in that context? Four so, to four so maybe? probably more the the five o'clock range to four in the afternoon, four to five in the afternoon would be most typical of what we would run. Okay, then I think the other question he was posing was the noise on the trucks as they back up. If you could okay, with, that a little more, yeah, little more with depth. the backup alarm. So, um, you know, we still got to meet the minimum requirements that OSHA st states for our safety. So it has to meet those specific decibels but it's not to the point of the um, beep, beep, beep that you hear that gets to be annoying. It's more of a, um, like I said, a, a squawk that makes a noise where it's not as quite as shrill, but it still gets the people right next to where the operation is happening um, have that. And most of the backup alarm part, start part of it is gonna be actually our physical loader operator running on the site. The trucks with how we have the ingress and egress set up shouldn't be backing up on site very much at all. So you feel the noise would actually be reduced from what is currently happening? I would say it will be because the overall noise from the plant will reduce as well. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Palermo, you're recognized. There we go. Kyle, come back up, please. Kyle, please name and address for the record. Uh, yours, or Cut. yeah, the clerk's going to want your name and address. I, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. The clerk's going to want your name and address. I know you just okay, left, but not Okay, Kyle Timmer, um, Omni Engineering, 14012 Giles Road. Yeah, so our dividing line for District 3 and 4 is obviously Grover Street, okay. uh, where Councilmember Vagley actually has uh, this business and other businesses. I have the residential uh, neighborhood to the south. Now, I have heard some opposition. Sometimes people feel, well, this business has been here forever, so we just have to live with it. But then changes come along and people know they have a voice and they say, well, maybe it's our time to say something. So um, I had a situation similar to this where a development or a special use permit was approved. And regardless of how this vote goes today, take this with you. Uh, some of them backup alarms, they have them swisher alarms now. and those who complained about at least that backup alarm, which is constant. And unfortunately, if you're running a 24 hour operation at sometimes, yep. uh, those houses that are less than a block away, uh, it might limit that noise they would hear. Um, so again, I understand you've been there, people get used to it, but it doesn't mean it's right. And when you come in and you make changes, I mean, sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. But when I hear traffic counts, I instantly go to the amount of traffic because if you're making changes, I assume, knowing that you know in your business what, what could change on other plants not being able to fully operate uh, as you would like them, with the equipment you're putting in, I imagine there's a uh, top end amount of what you could push out for trucks. So although it sounded to me like you're going from maybe 100 to 300 with the 
new equipment you're putting in, change of the road, uh, added extra piles, what what could you see this plant uh, in the truck the truck traffic bringing? I mean, I, w I would say at the 300 truck count a day with material coming in and the material leaving the site, um, that's going to be a good average for one of our busier days. Will, could it be higher than that? Uh, we could have more mix going out during certain days where the truck count of the asphalt would be higher. But if we have the stockpiles available, we can manage how that truck count is. Um, I mean, if you look at a couple hundred trucks a day, and if you would say average 25 um, ton of load, um, because material trucks coming in haul 30 ton, our asphalt wet um, trucks going out haul anywhere between 18 to 22 ton. Um, so math on that would be 200 at 25 is gonna be about that's an extra 5,000 ton a day, okay. right? So that would be, we wouldn't even get to that point. I mean, unless the economy of Omaha takes off so greatly and we have a bunch of asphalt work to do, I would find it hard to believe because we aren't even anywhere close to that right now on a single day. So that, that batch plant, and maybe that's not the right terminology, but yep. the, the <clears throat> production that would come out of there, you don't see it uh, increasing more than the 300 uh, traffic count of the trucks in and out based on what that plant could make in the in the 24 hour period right it, if, I mean if it was running 24 straight through with full production it could do that but I don't see our economy as that right now with where it's at you know we have growth that's built into what we're doing but we would be looking at that so could it be over 300 trucks someday I would say there's a potential but it would be um, very few days during the year. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bigley, you're recognized. Thanks, Mr. President. I, I, I just uh, wanted to thank, I spoke to several property owners and business owners down on Grover Street, and in this position that I've been in for going on whatever, eight or nine months, I always hear from constituents and neighbors and businesses, but very rarely do I hear from developers or people that have a vested interest in projects. And, and I, I, I'm learning this, that it, it really resonates with me that there's a lot of things that I did in this item, this agenda item, talking to staff, talking to neighbors, but I never did get outreach from anybody beyond the business owners and neighbors that were on record why they oppose it. So I just want to make that observation and comment for people listening that it's important to engage your city council representative when there's agenda items that could be impactful and controversial on an agenda because my six colleagues and I, we do our homework, but it's always good to hear from people that are on the agenda and get the perspective on the business side or the developer side on what they're going to do. So um, I, I just wanted to make that comment for the record. Thanks, Mr. President. Thank you. There's no further lights. Is there a motion? Second. Motion and a second. Roll call. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Rowe. Yes. Bagley. No. Harding. Yes. Johnson. No. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed four to three. Items nine and 10 can be considered together for property located southeast of 189th Street and Bedford Avenue. Ordinances to rezone this property from DR District and R4 District to DR District and R4 District. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing and vote on items nine and 10 are today. Proponents, please. Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Roll call. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Rowe. Yep. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Yes. Johnson. Mr. President. Yes. Items 9 and 10 are approved 7 to 0.
Item 11, an ordinance to amend the boundaries of the MCC overlay district to incorporate into that district the property located southwest of 90th and Maple Streets. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing and vote on number 11 are today. Proponents, please. Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed. I'll just ask a question since this is in my district. Um, well, surprise, there's not a proponent of any kind here, but I also think this is a pretty simple um, request that, um, at 90th and Maple that allows for a, what I think is a coffee shop and maybe a new Starbucks. Would that be correct, Mr. England? Eric England Planning Department. Yes, that is correct. Um, oftentimes when there is a plat or a rezone or a use permit um, and the adjacent corridor is designated for an MCC, Major Commercial Corridor Overlay District, um, staff requires that an application is made to apply that overlay. Um, it is only a benefit to have that MCC overlay in place. It brings in higher uh, building design requirements, higher landscaping requirements, so it, it is always a benefit. All right, thank you. And I might just reinforce maybe a similar comment then that we do expect applicants to be here for city council agenda items. Should there be any questions from council members or opposition from the public, that didn't occur on this one today, and it, I'm, I'm okay with that because I think it is a fairly simple project and it, it is beneficial to the corner, but uh, I wanted to note that as well. I can't make a motion, but I would take one now. Motion to approve in a second. Roll call. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Rowe. Yes. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item 11 is approved 7 to 0. Item 12, an ordinance to approve a major amendment to PUR overlay district located at 6405 Center Street. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing and vote on number 12 is today. Proponents, please. Kyle Hazy, ENA Consulting Group 10909 Mill Valley Road, representing the applicant. Um, the property uh, in discussion today is on the corner of 64th Avenue and Center Street uh, in the Xarban neighborhood. Um, it is the location of a new access bank. Um, I don't know if you guys have been by there recently, but it's a nice looking building. Um, the additional uh, PUR request that we're looking for is for the location of uh, the monument sign for the building. Um, I believe this is a reasonable request based on the size of the lot and uh, meeting the urban design um, guidelines um, for the city, which I'd like to see the building pushed up against the property line along Center Street, so it leaves a little room for, um, for that monument sign. With that, I'll make myself build for any questions. Thank you. Other proponents on number 12? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Roll call. Melton. Palermo, yes. Rowe, yes. Bagley, Aye. Harding, Johnson, yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed, six Thanks. to zero, Harding abstains. Thanks. Items 13 through 15 can be considered together. Item 13, an ordinance to approve an amendment to the urban development element of the master plan to move the present development zone boundary at various locations. Planning board and planning department recommend approval. Item 14, an ordinance to amend section 31-259 of the Omaha Municipal Code to establish a new schedule of interceptor sewer fees. Item 15, an ordinance to amend section 10-313 of the Omaha Municipal Code to establish a new schedule of ASAP fees and to amend section 10-315 to update a, a list of ASAP projects. Public hearing and vote on items 13, 14, and 15 are today. We thought it'd be beneficial to have a short presentation by the Planning and Public Works Departments on these items as they represent an important concept in, in city development and planning. Mr. England, you're yeah, recognized. So I'll start it off. Uh, Eric England, Planning Department. Uh, we have member. Um, Madam Clerk. It's all, it's all together, I think. Yeah. Are you requesting such? I'm asking for a clarification. Okay. The, the intention is one vote. All right. Thank you. All right. Okay. Eric England, Planning Department. Good afternoon again. Um, so yeah, this has been a collaborative effort between planning and public works department. So we do have um, staff from public works here that'll go through a presentation. I just wanted to, to kick it off. And really not only is this collaboration between our departments, but really the development community as a whole. The master plan requires a periodic review 
of the present development zone boundary uh, when the sanitary interceptor sewer element is updated, which is generally every three to five years. We got a little delayed here this go around. Uh, COVID kind of set it back, and, um, but we've been working on this for a while. So the review is to be based on analysis of historical data, current trends, projected needs, and the availability of infrastructure. Um, so this information is used to program sanitu sanitary sewer extensions and other public improvements and facilities needed to meet projected growth demand. Um, the proposal would add nearly six square miles um, from the future development zone into the present development zone. This area, which um, staff will show in the presentation, the exact location, but this is entirely in the northwestern uh, portions of our jurisdiction. It's outside the city limits, but it is within the extraterritorial um, zoning, platting, and permitting jurisdiction. So um, I will leave it at that, but planning is available for questions, and I'll kick it off to Jim Tyler and Adam Wilmus with Public Works. Thank you. Uh, Jim Tyler, City of Omaha Public Works. Uh, Eric said pretty much everything that needs to be said. Uh, Adam Wilmus is going to start with a short presentation. Ryan Haas will follow up, and then people will be available for questions. He has some slides. I'm going to pass those out so you can look at those when he's presenting. Thank you. Good afternoon. Adam Wilmus, uh, Public Works Department, 1819 Farnham Street. I, um, <clears throat> What's coming around to you today is just a little presentation uh, we talked about in a Public Works Committee a couple weeks ago, and so some of you have, have kind of seen this material already, but just wanted to take an opportunity to talk a little bit about the process we went through on the sewer side of things to, to update the PDZ um, and uh, the interceptor sewer connection fee. Um, just want to give you some key highlights. A um, little background on what we're talking about, what was the need, I'll give you a brief overview of the process, where we where that process ended up, and then kind of the, the end result of where we're at today of that map of the PDZ uh, expansion. So just uh, right away, the highlights, um, really the, the present development zone of the PDZ um, in the interceptor sewer connection fee schedule, these things work together. As you open up new area and you build the sewers to serve that area, the fees pay for that sewers, and that's why they're so interlinked. Um, this, the single family residential fee, as we're, I'm gonna explain in just a little bit, has been modified how that's calculated. Uh, that's been done uh, based on feedback that we've received to support affordable housing. Uh, these proposed updates were presented to the planning board on January 5th. Uh, we did receive support from the development community and MOBA. Uh, that was adopted 7-0, and so of course we're here at council today for a third reading. Uh, we are recommending, <clears throat> as I may have mentioned, this this was an update that was done in-house, and we are recommending a, a fuller uh, master plan update in, in 2023. Uh, what I'm showing you here is uh, just, it's right out of the municipal code, it's our current fee schedule. We are in the 2019 and thereafter, so we've had a couple years with, without a fee increase on interceptor sewer connection fees. And what I'm showing on the left there is just kind of give you a sense of, uh, historically, this was taken from the last 10 years, where the, may, where the fees have come from. So just over half of these do come from a single family residential. Again, these connection fees are paid as part of new development, um, and they're paid at the time of the building permit. Uh, just quickly, like Eric said, uh, we have a plan. Uh, we had a plan in 2009. We had an update in 2015. That's the plan we've been working off of since then. Uh, we did have a, a flood in 2019 and then a pandemic, and so our, our work to get this out has been a little delayed. Uh, but that's we're here before you today to uh, uh, to introduce kind of the updates to that plan. Uh, just quickly, what we did, you know, we did a really in-depth uh, analysis of, of historic costs, um, as as you probably are aware construction costs, material costs, labor costs have all increased uh, pretty substantially since our 2015 plan. And so we really wanted to take a close look at that. Some of our projects that have been completed since that plan have been over the estimated costs. And so we wanted a, uh, a more accurate look at what it really costs to extend these sewers. Uh, we looked at pretty, 
close details I'm showing there about the sewer routing, how they're getting from point A to point B. And the third bullet point is really critical. We, we really want to try to balance PDZ expansion uh, with fee increases. And they work together, and so we were trying to find that right balance. And to do so, uh, we, we worked a lot uh, to reach out to developers and home builders. Um, their input led to what we're proposing today and what's on the agenda. Um, their input was critical. Uh, it led to changes, and it, and it really led to, uh, to where we're at today. So that was really important. Um, as far as the updates themselves, um, there is an updated fee schedule. That's, that's uh, uh, what we're here to talk about today. The, the single family, the big change in the single family is it's been changed uh, from what historically was a flat fee per unit, or per uh, home, to a sliding scale based on the size of that home. Okay, so now where a small house and a large house would have paid the exact same previously or even today, that will change based on the size. A smaller house will pay a smaller fee and a larger house will pay a larger fee. Uh, this was brought up in our outreach to developers and builders as a way to promote affordable housing. Um, and we focused on the single family residential as kind of the main uh, revenue source of this fund. And then we applied those changes, equivalent increases to the other categories, the commercial, industrial, multifamily uh, are increasing at an equivalent rate. Uh, of course, we're up updating the PDZ. Um, and as I said, these were really uh, based on feedback that we received. All right, here's my complicated slide that you probably can't see. <laughs> the, the top part is just, again, it's just a, a copy right of the current municipal code. It shows the current fee schedule. It just shows that we're in this 2019 and thereafter. The, the middle part here is really what, what we are proposing under the same um, kind of calculation method. So you got 15 through 19. It's showing 20 and 21, as I said, no fee increases were uh, happened in those years. What we're proposing is a 22, 2022 through 2025 fee schedule. The, the proposal to open up the PDZ uh, that, that was requested is an increase of $350 per year in the single family residential. And so that's kind of that middle table. Once we got the feedback on changing how the fee was calculated based on size, uh, Ryan Haas and, and I, and we looked back 10 years historically we looked at the size of the homes and different things, and the fee, the fee schedule on the bottom, where the re single family residential fee is based on the size of the home, is meant to be revenue neutral uh, to, the, to the table just above it. So an equivalent to $350 a year as a flat fee would bring in the same amount of revenue to this fund to support the sewer extensions as what's ultimately being proposed in the ordinance of a, a fee that's based on cents per total square foot. Um, and that's what's shown at the bottom. And then I will just wrap up <clears throat> to show, as Eric said, this is all kind of focused in the Northwest uh, Omaha area. If you, if you can see the map, I I'm, apologize, I'm sure the streets are a little difficult to read, but in the 2015 plan, the areas in gray were brought into the PDZ at that time. Um, since then, there have been uh, some variances granted and those are kind of shown in hatch. So there has been development that's gone outside the PDZ, thus kind of the need for this update. Um, the area in yellow is their sewers under construction today to serve this area, and then the area in purple, again, a, a, a close to another 2,500 acres, is supported by this fee schedule to, to fund the sewer extensions that will bring these areas into the PDZ. Um, and I will leave it at that, and I'm here to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Ryan Haas with the Public Works Department. I'll just briefly go over the changes to the ASIP fee. Historically, the ASIP, the Arterial Street Improvement Program fee is analyzed this concurrently with the interceptor sewer uh, when that plan is updated. So we did that, went through that effort as well this time around. Um, the three outcomes were, number one, changing, converting over the residential single family uh, the mechanism of the fee assessment, similar to what we did with the interceptors, so that's all matched up now. Um, in a way that was revenue neutral, we then are also proposing 4% annual increases each year for the next four years. Um, that's something that historically we've done going back to 
two thousand and five if you average it out it's it's essentially the same amount of infrastructure that can be built it's just um, obviously the amounts are higher but over time construction cost uh, increases occur so the the fee increase counteracts those those uh, conditions and then uh, the, the third update to the ASIP is updating the list of ASIP projects. We're deleting, obviously, the ones that uh, for which construction has been completed and adding the next two, uh, Q Street from 192nd to 204th and 156th Street from West Maple to Fords. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other proponents today? Uh, I'm 13, 14, and 15. Seeing none, any opponents? Good afternoon, Larry Storer, <clears throat> 5015 Lafayette Avenue, 68132, Omaha. I'm opposed to number 13. Uh, I guess also 14 and 15. Uh, it's a little difficult to read between the lines as to how those are all related. But also, I ha have to read between the lines of number 13 only that this sounds to me like uh, we're amending a plan, but we could also amend it again next week after we vote or don't vote today. It makes me wonder if you're moving into my neighborhood. When I hear the roar of the truck, are you going to do something in my neighborhood? With a, There's no vacant lots, but I guess that doesn't matter. It doesn't say that it's for sewers. It doesn't say it's for uh, tax increment buildings, financing buildings. Uh, Mr. Bagley says, yeah, people need to be tuned in or down here so they can kind of gather what we're talking about. Uh, I'm really confused because the rules on the front page kind of talk about a presentation. They talk about proponents. Uh, opponents, presenters, what, what's the, uh, oh, applicants. So there's four categories. Uh, we started off with proponents and then we had a gentleman do a presentation. So I get confused, I'm sorry, but uh, there are times where the proponents seem to get to come back more than once for a total of 10 minutes maybe, or at your pleasure they can come back. Now, I come up as an opponent when I'm an opponent. There are some people that like to come up as proponents when they're really opponents, simply because they can become, they can come back up. And they can maybe talk twice. But they can also talk if you choose to invite them to talk. We had a long session last week because of that. But I am definitely an opponent. And I think you need to change uh, how you process your own rules. Read the front page where it talks about presentations. These are all on a separate page. It doesn't imply that this is a presentation, but that's the way it works. So go ahead, ask me to come back up or ask, answer some questions. Feel free. Thank Any you. clarification Any on what I said? Thank you. We appreciate your testimony, Larry. Any other opponents today? Thank you. Seeing on public hearing is closed. Mr. Harding, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I want to just thank um, Public Works Planning and Finance. Uh, this, this really kind of helps build that roadmap for um, development in, in Omaha. And uh, not only does it give you that roadmap, but it also gives you the cost, or at least some of the costs associated with that as you take it through city processes. So uh, thank you. And it's important. It's an important step for uh, the continued growth of our, our city and the health of our city. Um, as a quick aside, I, I did have a conversation with uh, the city attorney about, um, and maybe even after the, the last testimony, I'll be making, um, I'll, I'll make a motion, um, but I'm gonna do them individually just so that we have a, a vote on each one of them individually. Although it made sense to have the public hearing, I think for all of them together um, in that sense, but think that we should probably at least, um, I think the, not to put words in the, the city attorney's mouth, but 
I think it would be more um, appropriate to have a, a separate vote on each. So with that, I will move uh, to approve item 13. Second. There's a motion and a second, and I will agree with that analysis. Mr. England, one more question for you. Um, so a lot of complicated um, concepts just discussed as, as pertains to zoning and sewers and infrastructure, but to boil it down for folks, perhaps the most simple, simple way we can express what is being accomplished in 13 and 14 and 15 here is that new development is paying for the infrastructure needed for that new development in Western Omaha, right? In this case, Northwestern Omaha. Yeah, Eric England Planning Department, that is correct. This funding source comes directly from the builders of these homes, um, the residents that are taking out building permits, um, the companies that are building offices, industrial sites, um, multifamily sites. So that is correct. This is not specifically a, you know, a, a fee that's generated you know, as part of the general budget. This is basically developer, um, you know, funds that are. <laughs> and to, to even elaborate a little bit, those developments, whether it's a residential uh, development or, or industrial office commercial, they are usually the ones that are putting in the actual sewers. They coordinate, of course, with our public works department. Um, you know, but those engineering companies that work on these developments, um, they are working with public works on the design of those plans and, and getting approval from public works. Um, and then ultimately, you know, their projects go in and, and there's a reimbursement. I can't, you know, I can defer to Jim and um, Adam exactly how that works, but that is correct. Yeah, I don't know if that answered that your question. That does answer my question. I just wanted folks to understand that's what we're doing here today. And, and that's an important concept because um, when we have development helping, helping to pay for the infrastructure needed for new development, it takes the strain off the current taxpayers and the current uh, development interests within the city as we continue to grow and ultimately grow our tax base when these things do occur. And then just confirmation too, I think it was mentioned in one of your remarks, but it, when you're doing this, it's also important that you have engaged the development community who is paying these fees. And I think you have in this case, I don't, I don't think we have any of those representatives here today, but they were at planning board. So if you wanna just talk about that for a second and confirm the support of development attorneys and MOBA and sure. organizations like that that I think were involved yep. in the conversation. Yeah, Eric England Planning Department. Um, it, it, Public Works kind of took the lead on setting up the meeting, but absolutely, we had a large engagement group that included uh, planning, Public Works, staff from the mayor's office, and we met with virtually all of the large engineering companies that do development work here in the city, um, as well as land development attorneys, developers themselves, whether it's single family, uh, multifamily, office commercial, absolutely. We had a, a, a great meeting and you know, really we had started off originally with, with a lower fee and a lower area to be included, but based on that feedback from the development group, they would like to see um, more area added to the PDZ um, and as a result of that, we revised our numbers, took another look at that, came, you know, obviously with more projects and infrastructure needed, the cost then went up, but that is kind of based on their request. And, and so we had a, a lot of good dialogue and um, yes, we did have some supporters at planning board that spoke. Okay, and consensus on these items today from that group. Yep, okay. absolutely. Thank you. Mr. Rowe, you're recognized. Thank you. I did. Uh, that was my the point I was going to make. I did have conversation with some of those in the building community and the and the development community, um, and they appreciated the level of engagement that they were allowed to share. They they have, nobody likes to see you know price increases, but they understood you know the reason for it because of the dialogue that you had with them, and and I think they appreciated that. They expressed it to me, and I just wanted to voice that uh, to you as well. Thank you. There's a motion and a second to approve number 13. Roll call. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Rowe. Yes. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. And 13 is approved 7 to 0. Motion and a second. Roll call. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Rowe. Yes. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. And 14 is approved 7 to 0. Motion and a second. Roll call. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Rowe. Yes. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. And 15 is approved 7 to 0. 
Item 16, a resolution to approve a special use permit to allow convenient storage in the CC district located southwest of 192nd Street and Grant Avenue. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing and vote on number 16 is today. Proponents, please. Kyle Hazy, ENA Consulting Group, 10909 Mill Valley Road, uh, representing the applicant, uh, Jeff McGregor, who is also in the audience and will be uh, following up and speaking um, after I'm done. I'm just going to give a quick overview of, of the site. <clears throat> As mentioned, it's in the northwest corner of 192nd Street, which is shown here on the map. We have Grant Avenue to the north, and Blondo Parkway is on the west side of the property. Um, we are looking to um, the area is currently zoned CC. Uh, we are looking to apply a special use permit for uh, convenient storage on the site. Uh, we'll have six buildings, um, convenient storage buildings as they go down the hill. And then up in the, the northwest corner, um, there'll be an office and portion of that um, office space or connected office space will be some uh, conditioned indoor storage as well. And then we'll have a gate um, on the west corner once we get past that area. Uh, we have provided uh, sidewalks along the, the adjoining roads and then um, well screened landscape as re is required by municipal code. The east side of the property, um, you can maybe see better in the, in the aerial photo, um, this area of, of the lot <clears throat> has been set aside for future uh, improvements to 192nd Street. Um, we show on this plan this would be the new alignment of 192nd street uh, so we take that in consideration um, in our site planning of this site as well uh, with that i'll make uh, myself available for any questions thank you other proponents that want to speak today hi jeff mcgregor 11750 stonegate circle omaha nebraska uh, i just wanted to uh, call attention that uh, uh, we have achieved a uh, unanimous approval at Planning Commission uh, for this. Before we went to Planning Commission in October, I did a neighborhood meeting where I invited everybody within a 300 foot radius of the property out to the mark uh, and reserved a room and kind of went over the plans with them. Only uh, one household did show up to that meeting. Uh, their comments were uh, that they'd like to see sidewalks, which at that time we did not have sidewalks on the uh, along Blondo Parkway. Um, so we have since added those. Um, I also have a letter from the uh, uh, from the uh, Rose uh, apartment complex next door to to us, uh, uh, expressing uh, their support for the project, uh, and that's the Edward Rose apartment complex that is uh, just to the uh, to the west of us and the north. Uh, as I kind of look at some of the uh, conditions uh, for the approval, uh, the first one notes that we need to submit a revised landscape plan, which we have done. Uh, eliminate any reference to the proposed development to the unrelated lots, which we've removed. Illustrate uh, a 10 foot wide trail along Grant Avenue. I was curious as to whether or not this is intended to be installed because it it does say illustrate a 10 foot wide. And then the next uh, item C says provide a sidewalk along Blondo Parkway. So curious, it seems like provide a sidewalk along Blondo Parkway is the condition is that we need to actually have it installed. Do we need to just illustrate the 10 foot wide trail along Grand Ave or do we actually need to install that trail? Uh, and uh, item uh, E, uh, was provide perimeter fencing, show that, and show where the gates noted. We have done that in our plan. Uh, and we've submitted the, the revised uh, landscape plan. Uh, we're not exceeding 20 feet. Uh, we have revised all of our uh, elevation plans to uh, comply with uh, the urban design criteria. Uh, one item in here was, I believe, 15 foot or 15 parking stalls. Uh, this, I, I'm sorry, I, I skipped over it. Item D, it's, it notes to provide 15 parking spaces. Uh, I believe this is because they were 
uh, initially thought that this was all going to be office. However, it's not all office. There's only a 20 by uh, 25 foot office in there, and the rest of it is climate controlled storage. And so uh, we believe we meet the criteria by having our uh, the parking that we've provided along there. And we don't we th we think that it was just interpreted incorrectly on the site plan at Planning Commission. Okay. We'll see if we can get those I'm questions available answered. for any questions. Thank All you. right, thank you. We'll see if we can get those questions answered for you here in a minute. Any other proponents today on number 16? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Mr. Harding, you're recognized. So Eric Anglin, please. So uh, Mr. McGregor had a couple questions about some of the uh, conditions um, that were uh, required prior to coming to the city council. So I was wondering if you could clarify the questions that he had on that, on those three items, I believe it was. Sure. Yeah. Eric, you <coughs> planning department. Sorry, I'm just looking down at the rec report here on my yeah, phone. So um, the 10 foot wide trail along the south side of Grant Avenue is required. So that was maybe not the best wording in the recommendation report. Um, we were making sure that the site plan was revised to show that, but yes, it does need to be provided. Um, all of the other items have been adequately addressed with the updated landscape and site, site plan, because that would have needed to happen before we would have scheduled this to come to city council. So, um, so specifically as it relates to the, the 15 parking stalls? That is correct. So what, are, are they required or not? The, the facility is required based on the amount of office space in that building. So um, much of that was due to, there was a previous office, larger office that's in the grayed out area. So that did not require a use permit and so that is not shown on the plan. I think there was some, uh, the recommendation report had talked about that and we had previous iterations that had shown that. So, um, what they are showing is acceptable. Um, I guess I'd have to go back and, and dig deeper in the file regarding why that 15 foot or the 15 stall comment is in there. Okay, I wanna make sure that what we're approving today though and is, is seems to be a little different than what the recommendation report says. Yeah, a and, and I think my apologies on that, that is probably from that earlier version that had the larger office building in the grayed out area. That's the best answer I have for you today. I'm confident the three stalls are shown is adequate for the office component of the storage facility, which is in the northwest portion of the site. Um, beyond that, you know, I... Okay. I guess. So, Kyle, can you come up for a second, please? Kyle Hazi, Ine Consultant Group, 10909 Mill Valley Road. <clears throat> there is a... Uh, <clears throat> uh, a comment within the report saying that there's 4,600, roughly 4,600 square feet of office space uh, provided. Um, and I think that just goes back to, as, as Jeff had mentioned, that this was originally, we had office on there um, to just call out that that's where the facility's office would be and then the rest would be conditioned office space. So I think that's where the uh, 15 space requirement came into mind, which I think um, Eric kind of talked to as well. Yeah. Which. I'm fine with. I just want to make sure that what we're approving today, yeah, in 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 the documents that we have, sounds like different than than what's actually being recommended. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'll turn to city attorney. I, is there an amendment that needs to be made to this document then? Thank you, Matt Cousy, Law Department. To the to if the council wants to make an amendment to it, you certainly can. I'm not clear if an amendment actually needs to be made, um, but for, I guess, completeness, if the council would feel more comfortable with having that, um, so the accurate or the most accurate information is out there, I think that can be done as well. Okay, Jeff, let me ask Jeff then. If, if approved as, it is, as we have on the record, maybe that's maybe a better way to, that we can also accomplish this. Are you comfortable with what's been said, what's required by the planning department on the record today, rather than having to, to maybe amend the conditions? 
Yes. Okay. If you're comfortable with that. Yes, sir. You're comfortable with that, Eric? Okay. And is that a motion? <laughs> motion and a second. Roll call. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Rowe. Yes. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. And 16 is approved 7 to 0. Thank you. Item 17, a resolution to approve a major amendment to the large project special use permit to allow communication services in the GI district located northwest of State Street and Blair High Road. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing and vote on number 17 is today. Proponents, please. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the council, Kevin Anderson, Mayor's Office, uh, here in support and to make myself available for any questions. Uh, we, are, we are aware of a letter in opposition. I can speak to that if the council so desires. And then we've got other members of the development team here as well. Thank you. Thank you. Other proponents, please. Mark Norman uh, with the Greater Omaha Chamber, 808 Conagra Drive. Um, just here on behalf of the client and happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Other proponents? I'm Gary Norton, 1917 South 67th Street with HDR, uh, here on behalf of the client to answer any technical questions you might have. Other proponents on number 17? Seeing none, any opponents? Seeing none, public hearings closed. Motion and a second, roll call. Melton, yes. Palermo, yes. Rowe, yes. Bagley, Aye. Harding, Johnson, Mr. President. Yes. And 17 is approved, 7 to 0. Item 18, to consider a Class C liquor license for Admiral Omaha, located at 2234 South 13th Street, Ace Communication Opposition. Public hearing and vote on number 18 is today. Proponents, please. Hi, uh, Sean Reagan from the Admiral Theater, Admiral Omaha, 2234 South 13th Street. And I'm a, I'm a non-managing partner of Admiral Omaha. I'm here with Jim Johnson. He is a managing partner. He could probably answer technical questions. I'm here pretty much for everything else. Great. Thank you. I like uh, your mask, too. Pardon? I like your mask, too. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Other proponents today? Uh, Jim Johnson, Admiral Omaha, 345 South 70th Avenue. Here for any questions. Thank you. Are there any other proponents on number 18? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed. Mr. Bagley, you're recognized. Thanks, Mr. President. Jim, a couple questions for you. I'll start with you, I guess. Okay. That's the old um, Soka Hall, yes, correct? Yes, um, So I, I, as I'm driving the area, I see a lot of the work that's been going on down there, and I, I think it's great that you're um, redesigning that building for future use. Um, can you talk a little bit about the security for the <clears throat> establishment and the building you're going to have there for events you'll have? Um, security will be similar to how it's always been done. I've been doing concerts there for 26, 26 years now. Um, we will have a combination of t-shirt security and off-duty Omaha officers. Um, okay. And do, do, you, uh, do you have other establishments or other businesses that you own in Omaha? Yes, uh, I have several businesses up in Benson, the Waiting Room, Reverb Lounge, Krug Park, the Sydney, and then also the Bourbon Theater in Lincoln. Okay, so you have pretty good experience in the events you're doing here at the old Sokol yeah, Hall yes, as well yes, as sir. around, so okay. I know there was a, a letter in opposition, um, a, a resident on up the street on Martha Street was just concerned about people urinating around his house or so you'll, you can address that, at least you'll have security on site that yes. can deal with that. And we've also added about 20 bathrooms, so. Okay, <laughs> great. I, I was reading that in your report. I'm glad you brought that up, because that's something when I went to prom there in 1987, <laughs> it was a little different building, but you invested a lot of money and in, in that hopefully will address the issues that neighbors were concerned about with security and other issues. Yes, we've had, I mean, complete renovation of the facility. Okay. Thanks. I good best of luck to you. That's right on Councilman Palermo in, in my district, but he might have some comments. But I welcome to District Three. I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Prom in 1987, huh? Okay. Mr. Palermo, you're recognized. Yeah. Geez, that was a long time ago. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and, and yeah, thanks for taking on this venture. Obviously, um, a lot of money invested in a very historic building uh, and a part of downtown that's you know thriving and a lot of stuff going on. So since you've, you've been in this business a while, I, I think you know what has to be put in place to alleviate some of the concerns from the neighbors as far as trash and, and that sort of thing. Maybe patrol the neighborhood a little more uh, and I'm sure we can take care of some of these problems that uh, we've heard about uh, on other occasions, but I'm not pointing the finger at you if you know you, you had the building before at some time, but maybe not fully managed it. So, um, well, we've, we've never ran the building. We just used it as a rental hall at that time and then had the opportunity to buy it about a year ago. Yeah. So had events there, but not fully in charge of it. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. But now you are. Yes. And you know how to make this successful and also to make the neighbors happy. So Absolutely. I'll, I'll hope that you'll do that. Absolutely. Thank you. And I would just add, having had experience with uh, Mr. Johnson as an operator in the Benson area in particular, and uh, the many op many businesses he does own there that he recited that it has gone very well, and uh, he knows what he's doing after 26 years, and I have full confidence that uh, I'll make the SoCal a su successful operation for the city too. Thank you. I did want to ask, uh, is there a gentleman in the back that was intending to testify? Yeah, I was going to step up when you asked for objections. I just had questions. Come, come on down. I'll recognize you since I, I, I think we didn't, you didn't have a chance to come down for that. And your name and address, and if you're a proponent or an opponent. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm really, I mean, I'm for it, this, depending on the questions, pretty much. Um, name's Ed Black, 2201 South 14th Street. I happen to live right around the corner from the business. Um, over the years, all the concerts that have been there, I'm one of the people that end up with all the trash in my yard, you know, or just the loitering people peeing in my yard. So it was the same question as Vinny was touching on. You know, what are they going to do to address those issues or, you know, the problems that come from if they're going to be serving alcohol, the problems that come when they leave there and then they get into my area. You know, the destruction of property that we see, which is, that's rare. But these are all stuff that happens there. So that was the only questions I had towards them is how they planned on addressing that Great. more than anything. Thanks. So, so I'm glad we brought that up too. And um, maybe you can exchange business cards on the way out to make sure that uh, that goes okay as a neighbor. And Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we always want to be good neighbors and we're invested in the neighborhood and want to invest more in the neighborhood. So we definitely would like to keep all the neighbors happy. Great, thank you. No further lights, is there a motion? Second. Roll call. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Rowe. Yes. Bagley. Aye. Harney. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed, six to zero, Melton abstains. Thank you. Thanks, you bet, you. good luck. Item 19, to consider a Class D liquor license for NP Mart 13, located at 901 North 24th Street, Suite A. A is a request from the applicant to postpone this item to the February 15th meeting. There's been a request to postpone for one week and continue the public hearing. Is there a motion? Roll call. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Rowe. Yes. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Yes. Johnson, Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed seven to zero. Consent agenda. Any member of the city council may cause any item placed on the consent agenda to be removed. Items removed from the consent agenda shall be taken up by the city council immediately following the consent agenda and the order in which they were removed unless otherwise provided by the city council rules of order. Public hearing on agenda items number 20 through 24 were held on Fe February 1st. Motion and a second. Roll call. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Rowe. Yes. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed seven to zero. We've had a request to remove number 33 from the consent agenda. So we'll start with items 25 through 25 through 32. The public hearings on those agenda items are today. If you wish to address the city council regarding those items, please come to the microphone, indicate the agenda item number you wish to address. Identify yourself by name, address, who you represent, and if you are a proponent or an opponent. Items 25 through 32. 
25 through 32 first. I apologize, my hearing isn't 100%. Susan Ann Koenig, 1266 South 13th Street, uh, appearing uh, uh, as a proponent of number 33. Okay, so we're gonna get to that next, Susan, so I'll call you back up. You. So we're doing 25 through 32 right now. Any proponents or opponents? Good afternoon, Mr. President, sitting members of the council, Deputy Chief Anna Colon, Omaha Police Department, 505 South 15th Street, and I'm here as a proponent for item number 32. Great, thank you. Any other testimony on 25 through 32? Seeing none, public hearings are closed. Roll call. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Rowe. Yes. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed seven to zero. Item 33, a resolution to create the Little Bohemia Business Improvement Area Board. Okay, we have the public hearing on number 33 now. So now we'll take proponents. Susan, if you want to come back up. Thank you, Council Member Susan Ann Koenig, 1266 South 13th Street in Little Bohemia, uh, on behalf of Koenig Dunn Law Firm uh, and the applicants uh, here today. Uh, also appearing uh, uh, today uh, with me is uh, Lewis Smith of Dundee Bank, uh, also in support, um, uh, Colleen McClay uh, um, McClay Development, Jeff Pappas, Bohemian Gardens, uh, and um, did I say Lewis Smith, Dundee Bank? Yeah. So. Uh, oh, and Carolyn McBride, Rebel Interactive. Uh, I um, live and work uh, on South 13th Street in the heart of Little Bohemia, right, right off 13th and William. Uh, last year, our law firm celebrated 20 years of uh, having our business there. Uh, I grew up uh, walking distance from there, uh, and it's been thrilling to see the revitalization in the past years uh, in the area. And um, our priorities um, going forward would be the safety first uh, for our neighborhood. Uh, we're also interested in promotion and beautification, but safety is our number one uh, intention. Uh, and um, um, we, this has been uh, a historic area for over 150 years and would love to uh, give it everything it needs to be able to um, have many generations in the future enjoy it. Great, thank you. Thank you. Other proponents, please. Anyone else wanna speak as a proponent? All right, any opponents? Come on down. Kim Kalkowski, um, 1502 South Hensley. I don't know that I'm an opponent, but I'm just wondering, because I don't know what legalities are. Um, for a business improvement area board, that is um, by necessity has to be appointed by the mayor. Okay. That. Is that because I'm just concerned that being appointed by the mayor, although it says I live in the neighborhood and from South Omaha, I would take a great interest to, to it and as many of my neighbors would. And I can't see that any of us would ever be appointed by the mayor. So it would be business interest only. So that was my question. So you're saying that yes, all these people have to be appointed by the mayor? Well, uh, we'll get that, that question answered for, for you here in a minute. Uh, we can inquire with. Um the okay. council member from that area and also the city attorney as to how BID boards get, get appointed and approved. Okay, thank you. Any other opponents today on number 33? Seeing none, public hearings closed. Mr. Bagley, you're recognized. Thanks, Mr. President. I, I spent a lot of time with um, Lewis Smith. I see you back there, Lewis, with your mask on. And um, Susan, thanks for coming down. And I enjoyed my two or three times that I've attended your neighborhood meetings that you guys just formed here within the last maybe couple of years. Lewis, do you want to come up for a minute, if you would, and introduce, give your name and your address for the record? Yeah, Lewis Smith, Dundee Bank, 1407 William. Thanks for coming down today. And I, I know the hard work. Um, I, I've really enjoyed coming down and talk to your neighborhood association and going to the coffee shop down there. Artotype, is that how you say it? Archetype. All right, yeah. great coffee there in Little Bohemia. And just listening and meeting your n people that live in the neighborhood that are on that neighborhood association board, that the next step you're doing is the Little Bohemia Business Improvement Area Board. And as, as um, Kim had said a minute ago, it, it is appointed by the mayor and the council votes on those, but 
I'm really excited and I would hope that the passion in that neighborhood where there's a bunch of great little shops, great burgers at Fizzy's, Beercade, the small shops, um, the apartments that are being built down there. And I know the, the genuine passion that you've shown in, in the folks in your neighborhood association and wanting to make that a better thriving area, which it's been, you said the foot traffic when we met last week has really increased, which is great that we're getting through COVID. And I'm really excited for the work that you're putting in this and the vest and interest you have coming down here today. And I know Bernard Endenbosch and our law department got this process going for you. So mm -hmm. I'll look to continue the, the relationship that we have and I'll do everything I can to meet the interests of your neighborhood association and form in the business improvement area board and hope that there is good buy-in from the neighbors is the point was made a minute ago by Ms. Kokowski, that there are good citizens that have the vested interests to make this a great area that can grow like a lot of the areas in my district in the city. So did you want to offer any comments today since I'll put you yeah. on the spot, Lewis? Yeah, absolutely. Well, we thank you for your support, uh, Councilman Bailey and the rest of the council members. I will say that we plan on having open houses uh, to discuss with businesses and and neighbors of this, you know, very historic neighborhood, so that no stone goes unturned, and um, we address any questions or concerns that anyone has, uh, because again, it's been a neighborhood that's been around for 150 years, like, like Susan said, and we want to address, you know, any concerns that anyone would have. So I thank you for your time. Okay, thanks for coming down, and and again, I I, I wish you guys the best of luck, because I know there's a lot of hard work going on, and I, I again really enjoy coming down. Last summer, that was one of the first stops I made on a Saturday with some family members in the parking lot. You had that, the tents set up, it was pretty hot, but get a cold beer and an ice cream cone or whatever right. yeah. your deal is to stay cool. But I, I really appreciate you coming down and look forward to a good relationship and I know you'll work hard in this, so thanks. Great, thank you, Councilor. I'm not sure we got your name and address just for the record. Yeah, Lewis Smith, Dundee Bank, 1407 William. Great, thank you. Great. Thank you. Mr. Palermo, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President, and just a comment uh, obviously, having uh, been through the last uh, BID uh, with the board that was set up in, in South Omaha, at least I think it was the last one, um, there's a lot of moving parts. And for those who are interested in, in being part of this uh, area board, uh, look no further than Council Member Bagley, District 3, uh, because keep in mind, it's five or more, which means if you're a business owner or somebody who lives in the area, uh, reach out to Council Member Bagley. He can make a recommendation to the mayor. Uh, the more recommendations we have, the more people you have involved, the more successful uh, this, this growing area is. Uh, obviously, we just had a liquor license in front of us, uh, kind of the bookend on, on one end of it, and obviously uh, the old market is the other end. So uh, a lot of really good things happening. This is just another step in the process. So if you're interested and you want to be a part of it, reach out. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Milton, you're recognized. Thank you. And that's what I just wanted to clarify that in a BID, the business owners in the BID are, are actually paying. Um, and they're, <laughs> so they're, they're accepting to pay extra to have the BID. And Mr. Cousy, I believe that the appointments then are the people that are paying and belong to the business district. Is that correct? Oh, Bernard's coming down. Sorry, Bernard, I didn't see you back there. Any chance I get to send something for Bernard to do, I'm going to take it. <laughs> Bernard Indenbosch, Deputy City Attorney. There is no question. The statute's actually pretty broad as to who can be members of the Business Improvement Area Board. I mean, it could be owner, any owner of property, any resident, any company, any commercial. And, and the purpose of this board, frankly, is to explore whether a business improvement district would be appropriate for this area, and if it's appropriate, what kinds of things the board would do. So, uh, but at this point in time, it's pretty—it's open pretty much to anybody. Uh, we certainly have some business improvement districts that residents are excluded from assessments and some of those other things, and so they may not be participants in the board. And frankly, in other areas, it's quite the contrary. So, uh, it is pretty open. This is just the preliminary step. Will allow Little Bohemia to explore as to whether this is the way they want to go. So, so at this point, then they'll have meetings, and I know the BID meetings are open to the public. So, and I think what I heard um, from Lewis Smith from Dundee and also Susan mm -hmm. that those will be posted. So then, 
Ms. Kilkowski would be able to attend and maybe be a part of, of getting, you know, if she wants to be, if she wants to be a part of that, those will be open meetings? Sure. And when I meet with people who are interested in forming the business improvement district, and, and there's no question <clears throat> that the board itself is appointed by the mayor, confirmed by the city council. So I think Mr. Palermo's advice uh, approaching Mr. Bagley about, about people was good advice. <clears throat> the reality is in order to create a business improvement district and in order for it to be successful, you have to have support of the people who live, work, reside in the area. So part of the discussion that I had with, with Mr. Smith and the other people that were interested in creating it is, you need to have public meetings, you need to have it open, you need to allow people to participate, because if you don't, uh, and the first time people hear about it is when they get notified about a, the hearing before this, before the council to create a business improvement district, uh, that ends up being problematic because the very first thing the council is going to say is, hey, how many public meetings did you have? Did you try to participate with people that were in the community? And if the answer is no, uh, as you know, that obviously will cause some concern for the members of the council. So absolutely, I encourage people to do it. Uh, they've obviously indicated that that's their intention. And frankly, it has to happen, otherwise the business improvement district, the times that they have failed to be created, and there are a handful of those that have occurred, it's generally been because th there hasn't been that uh, effort to reach out to people in the community. Oh, thank you very much, Bernard. That, thank you. Just wanted to, to clarify that for everyone. And if I could, um, Susan Koenig, could you come up just real quick? And I'm only calling you up because I, I, you know, I know how um, nice you are. So would, yeah. so while you're, what, where you're out, would you make sure that you give your contact information to Miss Kilkowski? Oh, yes. so, because it sounds yeah. like she wants to be involved and be a part of it. And yeah. uh, so I, and I know that that you're, you're committed to to the area. Um, I've been to your firm many a times. It's mm -hmm. it's a wonderful place, and I appreciate oh. everything that you know your firm has kind of done in that area to, to keep it thriving well, and so uh, julie kalkowski has been a a long time public servant of our city and uh, and i consider her a good friend so uh, if she doesn't already have my contact information i'll make sure that she has it but for the record uh susan k uh, at koenigden.com okay thank you thank susan you. i appreciate that thank you thank you miss johnson you're recognized Yes, um, Bernard, if you could come back up, please. Bernard uh, Bosch, uh, Deputy City Attorney. Thank you. Bernard, I just wanted to come up and have you come up and personally thank you for your, uh, your uh, effectiveness in reinforcing the need to engage everyone in a business and everyone, business owners and residents within a, bis, uh, within a business di district. I kind of like how you um, provided us with, you know, uh, what, a, what a good business district look like when we do this and how effective that business district is when this happens. And I think that's very important because Sometimes we get business districts that do not provide this type of engagement. And then we have all kinds of questions like, you know, how did I get assessed for payment at the end of the year and things like that. Those things could be all uh, avoided if there was simple engagement such as having the public meeting things like that. Those are all key characteristics that we need. And I just would like to publicly thank you for providing that information, especially for those that may be listening <coughs> in the audience today. You're thank um, you. Thank you. Um, Lewis, yes. if you could come up, please. I also would like to um, personally thank you for um, sharing the information that you are going to go within your neighborhood mm -hmm. and engage not only the business owners, but also the residents. I think when we engage people into conversations about things that will impact them ultimately in their day-to-day -day lives, 
then that makes them feel a part, be a part of the political process. It causes them to feel like they have opportunities and it embraces them to be a part of the solution rather than be against what's new and what change is about to happen that ultimately could be good for the area. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you very much. That concludes your remarks, Ms. Johnson? Okay, thank you. And I would just add, uh, before we take a motion, that uh, I'm also supportive of this, of this effort, too, having been through this process a number of times. And in many respects, this is the easy part today, as, as others have observed. Um, and the next few steps are very critical in terms of getting that buy-in and that engagement. And once you spend the time doing that, uh, you can have a very successful operation, I think, and organization. And I don't think you'll have a problem doing that in this area, given all the potential that we see there and all the things that are happening. So I'm, I'm very encouraged to see this occurring and, and we'll be supportive of it. The other thing I would observe maybe for my fellow council members is that I think Bernard does a very capable job of handling BID requests and BID processes and facilitates, you know, the Board of Assessment issues and also billing and all those things that come along with it. But I've always kind of thought at some point we're going to get to a critical mass and a good critical mass of BIDs throughout the city when we talk about downtown and Dundee and Benson and Elkhorn and Blackstone and South Omaha and North Omaha and now Little Bohemia. And I can think of many other areas where this would be great too, whereby it might be beneficial to have another person at the city who could help be a coordinator of such for such BIDs and help facilitate their work that maybe isn't also a city attorney <laughs> uh, during the day. Not that um, we wouldn't appreciate Mr. Nimbosh's experience and ongoing involvement with it, but it just seems to me that could help in many of these uh, with their work and, and how they operate and have that go seamlessly in the future. So something to think about. Having said that, there's no further lights. Second, roll call. Melton, yep. Palermo, yep. Rowe, yep. Bagley, yep. Harding, yep. Johnson, yep. Mr. President. Yes. Item 33 is approved seven to zero. Item 34, an ordinance vacating a parcel of land being a part of the right-of-way of Blair High Road, Planning Board and Planning Department, recommend approval. Public hearing on number 34 is today. Proponents, please. Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Item 35, an ordinance to accept the bid from Nebraska's Best Lawn and Landscape LLC for grounds maintenance at the Missouri River Water Resource Recovery Facility in the amount of 26,000 annually. Public hearing on number 35 is today. Proponents, please. Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Item 36, an ordinance approving amendments five and six to a grant award contract with the Nebraska Department of Natural Resources for the combined sewer overflow program. Public hearing on number 36 is today. Proponents, please. Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Item 37, an ordinance to approve a letter of agreement and to accept the grant award for the City of Omaha Police Department K-9 unit in the amount of $20,000. Public hearing on number 37 is today. Proponents, please. Mr. President, sitting council members, Deputy Chief Anna Colon, Omaha Police, standing as a pro uh, proponent for 37. Thank you, Deputy Chief. Any other proponents today? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Item 38, an ordinance to approve an agreement with Boys and Girls Clubs of the Midlands in the amount of $50,000 and to authorize funding for such agreement from the City of Omaha Fiscal Year 2021 Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant Program. Public hearing on number 38 is today. Proponents, please. Deputy Chief Anna Colon, Omaha Police Department, as a proponent for item number 38, standing available for questioning. Great, thank you. Other proponents on 38? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearing is closed. One public hearing can be held for items 39 through 44, ordinances to provide that the City Council of the City of Omaha be authorized to issue and sell general obligation bonds in an amount not to exceed $15,100,000 to acquire, construct, improve, equip, and rehabilitate City of Omaha public facilities in an amount not to exceed $24,100,000 for the cost of constructing, reconstructing, improving, extending, and equipping sewers and sewer main construction 
in an amount not to exceed $15,400,000 to provide funds for Barry's Park and Recreation Improvement Projects, in an amount not to exceed $6,100,000 to provide funds for the cost of various capital expenditures of the City Fire Department, in an amount not to exceed $79,600,000 to provide funds for streets, expressways, and freeway related items, in an amount not to exceed $120,000,000 to provide funds for the cost of streets, roads, and bridges. Thank you. Public hearings on items number 39 through 44 are today. Proponents, please. Deputy Chief Anna Colon, Omaha Police Department, sending as a proponent for item number 39. Thank you. Mr. Curtis. Steve Curtis, City Finance Director. Uh, President Festers have asked me to come and do a brief presentation, so I'll try to keep it kind of short, but what's behind these bonds? So the first thing I would tell you is, when we do these bonds, we all know we have a capital improvement program, and these bonds come around about for these authorizations about every four years. Last time we did it was May of 2018. And what we do is use this document as our guide for the plan for what goes into each of these uh, tranches of debt. So with that said, here is a kind of a summary of what's in this. bigger so you can see it. Uh, roughly 260 million are in this. Of that 120 million are the new street preservation bonds and we'll talk about those in just a second. But you can see that the it follows the normal CIP structure. It's got transportation is one category at 79.6, street pre preservation and so on and you can see the various numbers associated with that. And again if you go back to the CIP you can see You can see that, uh, well, maybe you can't see that. Oh, there you go. You can see that this is the back page, uh, page 182 of the last CIP that was passed. And you can see there, there are the six numbers that coordinate with the, the numbers that we put on here. And so since these are general obligation bonds, it requires us to go out and get a vote of the people, which is what you will authorize this language being on the ballot that will come out in May. And again, this is a process that we do about every four years. Uh, one last slide I'll show you, and President Festerson's always pretty interested in this one. And what this shows are our reserves, our debt service reserve balance, and this is the fund that we pay, and this is actually two, it's really the normal debt service and the redevelopment bonds are both in this one. And what that shows is what our balance are, or what our balances are year by year, and what you'll notice is in year approximately 26 or 27, we get pretty low. Uh, do we want to get it that low? Probably not. Do we have a lot of levers and things that we can do between now and then? Yes. So this kind of reflects where we are at the moment. Some of the things that greatly affect that number and where you get to, we kind of use 10 million as our low watermark. Uh, we're not as concerned because we have that sort of hockey stick at the end, and that is a little unusual, but that's the payoff of the CHI, CHI Health Center debt. And so our reserves will grow quickly after that. But the levers that we have are things like interest rates, the valuations that come in on our real estate, uh, when particular projects actually happen versus when we think they'll happen can have a big effect on this. We can move a little bit of the debt service levy back and forth between the general fund levy depending on how we, how we look and that would be in the budget process. Of course, a levy can always be increased. We never did use the 3.5 cent yet that came with that original bond issue. So that's still available, although nobody seems to have an appetite for that. So uh, we're not counting on that one. And with that, uh, I would uh, take questions, or I think we'd do that at later, maybe. Yeah, don't go far. I'll have a few for you, I think, but thanks okay. for that overview. But for now, I'll take other proponents on these items. Seeing none, any opponents? I'll close the public hearing. Mr. Curtis, if you don't mind. So I think it's just important to, to highlight these since it is a lot of money and it would be expected to go if it's approved next week on the ballot for voters to consider um, on May 10th. And so I think it is important always to watch um, the amounts that are being proposed here and what they're going for as you talked about in the capital improvement plan and it is our ongoing funding source for those capital items that we must, we must suggest and must approve if you hope, hope to have those ongoing improvements to our city. But at the same time, it's also real important to watch our debt service, as you know, with the graph there, 
I think I've been working on that graph for about 20 years now. <laughs> I would say he's one of the few that actually understands that graph. <laughs> and so um, I did note when you, when you uh, helped provide that information that we do get awfully low in 2027, but I guess the good news is that's no, not as low as we might have anticipated given the relationship to what was also approved in 2020, which were, was the street enhancement bond program, $200 million over five years just for streets to improve our streets. Um, and so with that, what your current graph would show is that at least at this juncture, even with the approval by the voters of these bonds on May 10th, that you would not be anticipating a tax increase needed to fund that debt service at that point. No, and that's correct. And and remember too, like we said, we do have some other levies and things that we don't know that greatly affect us. We have a number of ways we can manage this number as it gets closer. And so that's good news, as you say. Um, everyone would like to avoid a property tax increase, even though voters did approve that bond issue in 2020, knowing that was a possibility. That was clearly part of the, the language and part of the discussion. So, but having said that, I also want to make sure we're doing what we said we were do, going to do with that bond issue. And this might also be a question for Mr. Stubbe, uh, if, if, he, if he'd prefer to answer. But could you outline for us what has currently been done in the 2020 street bond issue in terms of what, has, what products have been spent in 2020 and 2021, the first couple of years of that program? So if you remember when we did that authorization, it, it contemplated doing spending of $40 million a year for a total of $200 million. It contemplated that being done from years 21 to 25, uh, although the ordinance does give us the right or the ability to flex that all the way out to 2028 if, if we need to. So it, it has a longer period on that. What was suggested, and I think Mr. Stubbe would tell you they actually did, was they were prepared to start in 2020, and I think the mayor and others had suggested if, if we have things that are ready, we'll go. So after the first two years, well really after, at the end of 21, you would expect there to have been 40 million spent. And they're actually at 83 million spent. I think about 80 of that obligated three still in process. So they're running probably a year ahead, I guess is what I would say at this point. Uh, will they have to dial it down a little bit to stay within the authorization? Yes, but they've already spent, like I said, 83 million. I think that's also good news as we try to repair our streets. Um, and then that enhanced bond authority for our streets also would have to be renewed at some future point, just not right now with these bonds, correct? Well, and, and actually it, it is, if you think about it, because what we did, knowing that this covers the years 22 to 27, uh, the authorization that we got with the 200 million ended at 2025. And so we went ahead and put a couple of years of that one to sync it up with the rest of these. So it'll be more on this four-year cycle after that. So there's the, the, this 120 million that you see on the second line is new authorization beyond the 200 million. Okay. And then presumably, if we stay on the same track we have historically, if these are on the on the ballot in 2022 and are approved, the next grouping of general obligation bonds might be 2026 and would include yeah, that enhanced street commitment. Right, and that's normally how we do it, but it does kind of depend on how quickly you go through your authorization and how quickly you can spend. But it seems that we've seen it been on about a four-year cycle for quite a while now. Okay. And the reason why your chart there, why the debt improved so much in 2027, is the payoff of the CHI Health Center, essentially, right? Those right. refinanced bonds? Right. Now, one of the things that we don't have in this document yet, because we don't really know what it is, is the, uh, as Mecca has suggested, that it'll be time for a pretty big, uh, refresh and or expansion of the mall or of the CHI Health Center. And in fact, I'll be down Thursday to the legislature to testify on the bill that allows us to get more turn back tax related to CHI Health Center. Uh, we're going to try to get that to 150 million. Once that's baked into this, once we know what that is, and I, I suspect it'll change that trajectory quite a bit, but we it's way too early to know what that looks like. Okay. And otherwise, that enhanced authorization also would allow additional capital improvement projects throughout the city, our parks, our streets, our public facilities, to have an enhanced commitment as well. Yes, or as Council Member Melton would say, or we could cut taxes. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, yes, they'll, you'll have all those options afforded to you in a couple of years. Great. I appreciate your attentive to this issue and to uh, that graph and our projects. And I, I also want to make the point that as we're trying to manage that, which is important, that I don't want 
other day-to-day -day projects in the city to suffer either. We have this enhanced commitment to streets, but we've got to right. remain, remain committed to our parks and to our public facilities and our community centers and libraries and all those things that are also in this mix. So I know the council will be attentive to that and we'll have ongoing conversations about that. And well, and as you know, the driver of that primarily will be the CIP, which those conversations will start pretty soon, I would suspect. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you. No further lights. Next item. Item 45, an ordinance to amend section 23-177 of the Omaha Municipal Code to amend the pay range for the employment classification entitled City Council Chief of Staff Personnel Board recommends approval. Public hearing on number 45 is today. Proponents, please. Deb Sander, Human Resources, here to answer any questions. Thank you. Other proponents, please. Seeing none, any opponents? Seeing none, public hearings closed. I'll just thank Ms. Sander for working with us on this as she looks to, and the, and the HR department in general looks to work on all of the uh, salary scales throughout the city, of which this is one. Non action items, items 47 through 58, do not require public hearing or city council consideration at this meeting, but will be placed on a future agenda for public hearing and or, and or vote. The reason for non action is noted after the item on the agenda, as well as the date the item is expected to appear on the agenda for consideration. Second, roll call. Melton, Palermo, yes. Rowe, yes. Bagley, yes. Harding, yes. Johnson. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed 7 to 0. Meeting is adjourned at 351.